Hey guys, Katie here. I'm just popping in to let you know that this week, Jamie, our friend from the Neurodivergent Nurse Podcast, is taking over our timeline this week to share with you her brand new series that she's going to be doing regularly on her own podcast about ADHD and crime. So she came over with us and shared with Garrett and I a whole story about a serial killer who actually had ADHD. And we discuss different aspects of that case and that criminal and potentially the connection between nature and nurture and ADHD and crime. I hope you enjoy it. We really loved making this episode with Jamie, and we cannot wait to have her back on our podcast again. And as a reminder, if you want to have even more of the neurodivergent nurse in your life, you can follow Jamie on Instagram at the neurodivergent nurse, and you can subscribe to her podcast on all platforms. It is called the neurodivergent nurse podcast. So without further ado, the neurodivergent nurse takeover of the bar is ankle high. Welcome to this special episode, the new mini series of the Neurodivergent Nurse. Today, for the very first one, I had to get my favorite host of the podcast that they've been on my podcast before um, and they've had me on theirs a couple times too. I just love, love, love hanging out with these girls. Um, they just brighten my day. So anyways, Garrett, Katie, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your podcast before we hop into this episode? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Garrett. I'm, I'm Katie. Also making eye contact with Katie's cat, who's given a real dirty look. <laughs> She's got a heating pad, so she should be fine. But we host a podcast called The Bar is Ankle High, which um, we started because we were both diagnosed with ADHD as adults. And after I was diagnosed, I kept messaging Garrett and kind of saying like, oh, and another thing, do you do this? And is that ADD? And is that what's something that you deal with? And so it kind of uh, was born out of this idea of like, what, well, what would my life look like now if I had known even five years ago that I had this, um, and was able to work on it and either treat with medication or with therapy or just have the information of the diagnosis so that I can, you know, set myself up for success, um, and adjust my expectations of myself. So that was the idea behind our podcast. And it's, um, it's been great. We we're out for, coming up on 50 episodes soon. So, um, we've been having a great time. Yeah. We're actually starting to plan our like one year pod anniversary. I know, which is crazy. <laughs> that is exciting. When is that? September um, 1st. Yeah. So it'll probably be the episode that comes out the week after September 1st. Cause I think September 1st mm -hmm. is a Friday this year. Our episodes come out on Thursdays. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's coming up. <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> we're going to also talk about people uh, who have ADHD, but criminals. So on this episode, we're going to talk about Richard Ramirez. I, in my head, every, while I was writing this stuff and putting this all together, I cannot say this guy's last name and it's not a difficult one, but you may hear me say it about 25 different ways <laughs> while I'm talking about this guy. Well, he's AKA the Night Stalker. Yes. So. He is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, good. So I'm glad I didn't can realize just he had details. ADD. Mm -hmm. I yep. didn't either. Interesting. Yep. I yep. just knew he had like rank breath and those teeth. Yeah. Those good gnarly teeth. teeth. They were real bad. Yeah. Didn't the, I think um, Netflix just did a docu series like in the last couple of years on him that I watched? Uh, yes, 2021. I uh, was not able to watch it like I did the other person that I thought we were doing. <laughs> so. Well, that's okay because I forget things as soon as I watch them. So I won't have a ton of gaps to fill in. <laughs> that's unfortunate. I was hoping you would fill in the gaps. That's uh, okay. I watched the documentary. Episode. I can help. <laughs> oh, yeah. Katie will remember. I, I just don't ever. Oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> So that's good because like I said this morning, whenever I was texted y'all and I was saying, mm, I need a little bit more time because I was literally still putting everything together. 
So I only have, um, you know, meat and potatoes. Therefore, you're going to be the perfect, perfect person for this even more so. That's oh, great. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he's called Richard, uh, but he was born Ricardo um, and he was the youngest of five kids. He was born in El Paso, Texas to Mexican immigrants, Mercedes and Julian. So he had four brothers and sisters, and they were all born with birth defects due to the fact that their mom worked at a boot factory and she was exposed to a lot of chemical fumes while she was pregnant. Jesus. Yeah. And so this reminded me of the episode that we did on your podcast about 23andMe, where they were saying that maybe they they can help figure out um, through genetics and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm with who has a tendency or more prone to have ADHD. And while we were learning about all of that in the genetics, we also know that there's some environmental factors that can cause ADHD too, right? Like brain injuries or alcohol and substance abuse. Some of the things that we talked about even prior to hitting the record button on this episode. Mm -hmm. That is the craziest thing I think in the research that we've done is like, you'll read and it's like, well, it can be genetic. You know, you can be born with it, or you could have a traumatic brain injury that's causing you to have really poor focus. It's just like wild that those are the two factors that are so big. Mm -hmm. I agree. And when you were talking um, earlier, or, you know, when we were having a conversation about what our moms did whenever they were pregnant with us, sometimes (laughs) I, but my dad definitely has ADHD. He got diagnosed after I did, but I I keep thinking, is it because my mom smoked while she was pregnant? I mean, is that, cause like, I see the correlation between the two. I wonder if that kind of led my brain or maybe made it more pronounced or yeah, Mm -hmm. maybe, I mean, I, I, maintain that I think ADHD is a spectrum disorder Mm -hmm. similar to autism. So I think, you know, to the extent that, uh, potentially there's like those environmental triggers for ADHD, I think there's also the idea that, cause I mean, I know that we all hear it a lot where everybody's a little ADHD. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are to the extent that sometimes, yeah, everybody has a day where they just can't focus no matter what they do. Sure. Like it's called burnout and it can happen to neurotypical people too. But, you know, to the extent that like that goes from a neurotypical experience into a neurodivergent experience is, you know, a spectrum. How, how much are you going to be affected by your, your mother smoking while you're in utero or, or drinking or whatever, being exposed to tannins evidently. Um, and you know, to crazy to the extent that that could Mm -hmm injure the fetus, which we've also talked about, um, particularly in our hormone episodes is like, they just don't test these things on Mm -hmm. women Mm -hmm. in general, but definitely not pregnant women. So that's why, you know, it's like, can you take Mm Pepto-Bismol? You know, everything you have to Google because they're like, well, we just don't know. So the answer is no, because we don't want to risk it, which I understand. Like, like I said, I've said before, I'm not going to sign up to like risk my baby, um, being, you know, severely disabled as a result of saying like, well, we've got to find out somehow. And it's like, well, I wish you would test that on a mouse or something first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, there's those things where I think, because I think that ADHD is a spectrum disorder, there can be those, those instances where smoking might, if it doesn't cause it, it's what brings it out. So like you're, yes, you always had ADHD, but perhaps you struggle more with the anxiety part of ADHD or the disorganization part, or you have more impulsive, um, control issues. So I think it's not necessarily one or the other. I agree completely. Well, Richard, he ended up at two years old. He had a dresser fall on his head. So not only did he have the chemical exposure while in utero, but now he's, he's having head injuries. So that was the first one. Um, yeah. And then the first one, the first one, yeah. At five years old, he was knocked unconscious by a swing and he actually started having epilepsy and seizures because of that injury. And they also say that he sustained multiple additional head injuries at a really early age. Would they just like put him in a dryer and turn it on? Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like, it's not funny, <laughs> but I know like, that like, if I had been Garrett, a you're out. My, and my sibling got nailed in the head with a swing, I would have laughed really 
<laughs> oh, to- I mean, <laughs> I for sure took some tumbles as a child. Oh, <laughs> but like, God. I wasn't knocked unconscious by those tumbles. No, that's or, wild. Like, I didn't, as far as I know, have a fucking dresser fall on me. Damn. Which is mm. why they have them like anchored to the wall now. And you <laughs> think about like those. That's old true. Swing. They probably didn't anchor them back then. <laughs> but I mean, two years old, that's a yeah. pretty strong kid to be able to pull down a whole dresser. Well, well that's what you, they warn I'm about is like, like pulling the yeah, pull out the opening drawer and mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I did that a lot as a kid, but think I about like did that. It didn't swings. occur to me. <laughs> I think about like how heavy those playground swings are mm-hmm. like, man, if that caught you the wrong way, that could totally knock you out. That is so crazy. Well, then fast forward just a little bit to when he was 12 years old. He had a cousin, Miguel, that they called Mike, who was a Green Beret. He had been in the Vietnam War. Yeah, and he was like weird, right? Yeah. And yeah. he was he was one of those people that uh, Richard really looked up to. And he started to influence Richard's worldview as he became like that role model person. And the way that he did that, though is by showing him Polaroids of women that he raped. And he told him graphic stories of violence and mutilation that he inflicted on a lot of the Vietnamese women. I also read yeah. somewhere that he showed him a picture of him holding like a severed head of a woman that he posed I do remember with. this. Um, I yeah, I remember that from the documentary that he was, I mean, clearly we don't know if his cousin I think it's probably fair to say that he was struggling with some PTSD from being in a war zone, especially Vietnam. Like there's plenty of people who are in Vietnam that are still struggling today, but I mean, it doesn't excuse, you know, showing a child these images as like a way of trying to normalize what you saw and normalize what you did when you were in a war zone. Um, not that I'm excusing that behavior either, but it, you know, like, God, if, if we had just had like comprehensive mental health care for our troops in the seventies and eighties, then if maybe we still did or now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, if, if, if only, you know, we had done that back then and they had like acknowledged what they did to these troops and what the situations that they put these troops in, then maybe, you know, people like Richard Ramirez wouldn't have done what he ended up doing. But yeah, I remember in the documentary, they were talking about how he was like describing to him to, and it was like kind of as he was like coming into puberty, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was 12. Yeah. Like you're as a child, you're discovering like those sexual hormones and, Mm -hmm. and those urges. And so then when you're tying that into like extremely graphic imagery Mm -hmm. and this person that you're looking up to, your brain is going to conflate those, those things, especially when you've got multiple brain injuries Mm -hmm. right yeah he was already playing with a stacked deck against him so that's one way to put it yeah and then when he was 13 he saw his cousin shoot his wife in the face whenever they were going through like a domestic dispute they were arguing so he pulled out a gun and shot and killed his wife so he was there for that too jesus Mm -hmm. yeah did the cousin go to jail for that do you know He did. He went to jail for four years, but then he was found not guilty on grounds of insanity. Ah! (laughs) Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after that, (laughs) Richard moved in with his sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto. And Roberto ended up being a peeping Tom and would take Richard along with him for his after dark acts too. Was everybody just poisoned by the water in this town? Like, <laughs> what is going like it. on? It's the boots. <laughs> <laughs> just new boot goofing. <laughs> like the worst kind of new boot goofing. Oh my God. Holy shit. Took I almost can't like- even blame him for being a monster now because how could he not with all of right like what did we expect him to right. turn out as like mm-hmm. right not not even count like even if he didn't have all of the brain injuries and probably some sort of learning disability as a result of chemical exposure in utero but then on top of it he's going on these like deranged field trips with like cursed miss frizzle <laughs> and like whoa and they also said that his dad was really abusive physically to the entire family i believe that i mean and he was like leaving go sleep in cemeteries richard was uh to get away from his dad's 
abuse. That is a quiet place probably at night. I mean, I hope. (laughs) Well, then when he became an adolescent, um, he ended up getting a job at the Holiday Inn, but he didn't keep that job very long though, because he would use his pass key to rob people who were sleeping and his employment ended up ending really abruptly because he attempted to rape a woman in her hotel room before her husband got back but her husband ended up returning and catching him trying to do that and he beat the fire out of Richard but they ended up dropping the criminal charges because the couple lived out of state and they didn't want to come back to state to testify against him so he got another brain injury probably from getting the shit kicked out of him mm-hmm. and then yeah. they didn't prosecute him. Right. I did this, um, back. this, uh, continuing ed class for my, my license. So if your listeners don't know, I'm a, a lawyer by day. <clears throat> so I have to take these continuing ed classes every year or two, um, to maintain my license. And I took one that was about, um, ADHD screening for, children who are involved in the criminal justice system <clears throat> mm-hmm. and how it was this um, criminal defense attorney. And he was talking about how any child who comes into his office and needs defense, he discusses basically whether it's drug court or juvenile court or whatever, even if they're being tried as an adult, he makes sure that part of their plea, if most of them end up pleading out anyway, especially as juveniles, that they are given an assessment for ADHD and learning disabilities because so many people with learning disabilities and ADHD act out in potentially violent or destructive ways when they can't read or they're having difficulty reading or potentially they just have eyesight problems and they can't see the chalkboard and so then you stop paying attention. So it was just an interesting CLE, but he talked about how important it is for decreasing recidivism rates among youths that you actually screen for these things that potentially aren't getting caught by the school or by the parents um, through no fault of their own necessarily, but you can't expect somebody to not make that mistake again if you're just sending them back into the world without giving them the tools that they need to be successful And one of those tools is giving them a diagnosis. Like we were saying before, um, just having the information of the diagnosis is so helpful. It just gives you like knowledge is power. Even if you're not going to take medication, if you're not in a place where you're comfortable going to therapy for it, at least you have that information. So you can say, okay, I'm not a bad person because my dishes are literally overflowing my sink and I can't be bothered to empty my dishwasher. Like it's just that I need somebody here to do it with me so that I can do it. It's not, uh, it's not a personal failing, but if you don't have that information, it can be really easy to let yourself slide down that destructive path instead of trying to like figure out a way that works for you to get out of it. If R- Richard Ramirez had ADHD, then, you know, even with the charges having been dropped, if he had gone enough through that process and maybe gotten a screening for whatever learning disability he might have may or may or not literally have anything of right. the number right. of things that could have been wrong. Yeah. Like a fucking CPS intervention because right. no adults in his life were giving him any sort of healthy guidance. It seems. Yeah. Um, then he would have potentially also been at least, at least then we'd be like, what an asshole. And we wouldn't have to feel bad for, you know, who he turned out to be. Cause you're like, well, fuck, what'd you, what'd you expect? Yeah. Yeah. You know, And I mean, even with a diagnosis, because you know how we can become so hyper-focused on things that Mm -hmm. we are interested in. So obviously the seed was planted with this guy Mm -hmm. and I, again, don't condone any of this horrible stuff, but like, I can see how that hyper-focus and just like wanting more and more, especially sadly his hits of dopamine came from really brutal things later on. But yeah, if there was some type of treatment for mental health, period, then a lot of people would not have been harmed, I feel like. Yeah. Well, right. And I mean, all the, the either his cousin or his uncle or his, his brother-in-law, rather, you know, were giving him this approval by him participating in these like cracked out field trips. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where he learned to get dopamine from is by doing those things because- Either my older cousin will like me or my brother-in-law will like me. And like, we can bro out on that. And you get that, like, 
you, you feel less lonely because you have somebody to do stuff with. And yeah, the thing might be depraved, but that's what he's learning. So his brain is already making that connection. And the more you repeat that connection, we discussed this um, in our cannibal cop episode that we recorded. Um, but if you keep exercising those those connections in your brain, it's just like exercising any other muscle in your body. It's going yeah, to pathways. become, yeah, it's going to mm-hmm. be so much easier for you to like go down and continue to seek that. But then you also have to continuously up the ante. Right. Cause you're not going to be, you're not going to get that rush that you're looking for with the same old, uh, breaking into hotel rooms and stealing things that you've been getting this whole time. Right. And then you take it that next step and it just escalates. And I mean, had he been stopped at that juncture, if that couple had not stepped back from pressing charges, I mean, his outcome could have been completely different. Mm-hmm. Probably not good, but less well, bad. <laughs> yeah. He also got it. He got arrested or he got in trouble for some minor things too, when he was really young too. I think maybe drug possession. I can't remember exactly. I didn't put those in the notes. There are just multiple spots where interventions could have happened that would have helped change the trajectory of his entire life or the spree that he went on for a little bit of time. Yeah. It's kind of like that butterfly effect thing Mm -hmm. where, you know, just one thing could have completely changed the course of his life, you know, for better or worse, maybe. But when you take all of these different things together, you kind of set off this like chain reaction where at a certain point you can't stop it. It becomes Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. Well, and how many kids are neurotypical or have behavioral issues due to other factors and are labeled as bad kids Mm -hmm. and people don't want to take the time to invest in them or, you know, they aren't given access to the services that they need access to. And it just, it just, their life derails. Mm Mm-hmm. And it really just goes in such a bad direction. It's just, it's awful that in this situation, so many other people wound up involved too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he ended up moving from Texas to California when he was 22. But in 1984, this is the the first time that they found something that he did, someone that he hurt, even though later at the very end, we'll talk about in 2016, uh, they found that this person was not the actual first one. But in 1984, This man came home to see his mom and he found his 79 year old mother's body there. Her throat had been slashed. She'd been stabbed repeatedly and she was almost decapitated. And so then the son, his name was Jack Vinco, Vinco, I don't know, but he ran to the building manager to call the police. He waited about eight or nine months before he acted again. So that was actually kind of a long time, a long period of time that he waited before the first, you know, murder before he went to do something violent again. So March 17th, 1985 is when the serial murders started up. Maria Hernandez was getting home uh, after a day of work and unknowingly Richard had been prowling the neighborhood and seeking his next victim. So as she parked her car, she began to walk towards her front door and he noticed her and he decided that he was going to seize the opportunity. Without warning, he attacked Maria. He grabbed a handgun, demanded that she give him her valuables. So she complied. She handed over her belongings just like he told her to, but that wasn't good enough for him. Consumed by his sadistic desires. Um, he, he pulled out his gun and he tried to shoot her, but the bullet ricocheted off of a set of her keys. And so it only grazed her face. I remember this part of the documentary. Cause it was like, she put her hand up when he had the gun pointed at her to like cover her face and it like hit her keys. And he like panicked after mm-hmm. that. Like, Cause he, he thought like, he shot stared. her in the head. Right. Yeah. yeah. And cause she, I think she went down. But like nothing happened. And then, yeah, go ahead. I feel like I'm interrupting the story. No, no, I'm glad because (laughs) again, whenever I was reading this, I didn't watch the docuseries. So I was just reading different reports and stuff on it to try to put it together. And so I could not make a connection between what he did here. But I did read that, just like you said, that she fell down, she kind of played dead. But then after that, he went and actually shot her roommate in the head and killed her. Okay. So that was the thing. I wasn't sure if this was the same story. So I think it's that her roommate like came home and right, like, walked, right, right. like walked in on this. 
So then he shot and killed the roommate. And so the, the surviving woman like had a lot of guilt. Cause she was like, you know, I, you know, everything that I was the feel target, for, right. yeah, yeah. Having survived and blah, blah, blah. If I had just died, then he wouldn't have lingered and this, that, and the other, um, any number of things, but yeah, she was like, a survivor like she became pretty critical to the the hunt for him because she was mm-hmm. able to like obviously identify him so what was the difference though when you said like this started the serial murders did they link the murder of the 79 year old woman to him um eventually yeah oh, okay so when it first happened though did they think that it was just a random act of violence or did they think it was somebody who knew her because that's like super violent yeah, I don't know what they because the information about Jenny Vin that lady, <laughs> the the Jenny lady, um, I couldn't find a whole lot of information on her just about like what it looked like and how horrible yeah. um, and violent that it was, but not what the speculation was surrounding that initially. But the the serial murders is he actually started killing like multiple people on the same day too. Oh, okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. Because he left this after he shot the roommate uh the roommate's name was dale yoshi okazaki is the one that he fatally shot in the head an hour later he went over to monterey park and this person silian Yu, i think is how you would pronounce it but they used to call her veronica anyhow but veronica was getting back to her car after an evening out he saw her And so he decided that he was going to seize that opportunity as well. So he came up to her vehicle, pulled her out, and he shot her twice. And then that was when he got named the walk-in killer and the valley intruder. So that's what they started. Those names, those are both haunting as hell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I wonder why they always give serial killers such cool names. It should be like the small dick killer. Like, I don't, you, to pull down the notoriety, right? Like you, they give them these really cool names and I feel like it, it makes them when they hear being coined that then it's like a cape, you know, it's a, it's a Mm -hmm. great brand that they have now. BTK got off on it and obviously the Zodiac killer did too. Mm -hmm. So we had that Um, running joke between Katie and I about the, the guy who it was like a similar type name in a similar area. Um, it was the one who Patton Oswald's wife was writing the book about. Oh yeah. Um, uh, Eron's the East area rapist. Yeah. 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 And it was something like Golden the Night State Stalker. Killer. That's who yeah, yeah. 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 It was like a similar name, but the way that they wound up, like one of the ways they linked all of his crimes was that he had a really small peen and we were like making all these jokes about like all the things they could have named him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All of the nicknames he could have been given instead or of like Garrett's favorite criminal, um, Mr. F- you know, gangrenous flappy doodles, uh, true. Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> That's what they should have been calling him this whole time. <laughs> Take the wind right out of his sails. <laughs> <laughs> Cause, uh, if you don't know, he had gangrene in his, uh, undercarriage on his testicles oh, and they had to like, that. sew his, his actual testes like into his thigh to mm-hmm. save, save them virility, which yeah. like. Ew. Of all the people, like why? Just put a ping pong ball in there and call it a day. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. We've, I've taken care of uh, several patients who had that. And I mean, they end up like filaying these people in surgery. It is really, really gruesome. And yeah. Cause most they of the time like, they don't live, they don't no. survive this. Understandably so. Yeah. They're yeah. I'm saying I, it's a lot of like diabetics, alcoholics. Um, I don't remember like what his, he might have been diabetic. He is He's diabetic. And that's um, okay. yeah, no, I did a deep dive on the different types of gangrene after that conversation, because of course I did. Why wouldn't I? I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, I when like, I started oh. thought with, have you heard about Harvey Weinstein's balls? How can you not then? <laughs> Googling. Right. Yeah. And then she mentioned it for like five or six episodes in a row after that. <laughs> Every time I get the opportunity, I still bring it up and my um, spouse gets really mad. <laughs> that's why you bring it up, why you bring it up. <laughs> yes, yes. any chance to be annoying <laughs> well unfortunately this guy did not have it but he did end up with cancer and he died from that so good at the ripe old age of 53 but Ooh. yeah yeah well he wasn't destined to live a long life i mean all things no. considered yeah 
So 10 days after that whole spree where, you know, he murdered the two people, tried to kill a third, 10 days later, he went into um, a home in California that he had previously burglarized. Hmm. So there was a husband and wife that lived there, Vincent Charles Zazara. These people have really cool names that, (laughs) unfortunately, that he hurt. And so he lived there with his wife, uh, Maxine, as well. So Charles was 64. His wife was 44. Well, he goes in there. That's that's scandalous. (laughs) (laughs) Somehow the least scandalous part of this whole thing. (laughs) So did you meet at her daycare? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I know that's not the point of the story. We're going to hell. (laughs) (laughs) That is an age gap. I'm just saying. It is a bit of a one. (laughs) So he goes in and he ends up shooting Charles in the head while he's asleep. Well, obviously the wife's going to wake up from the gunshot. I would hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Richard ends up beating her and he starts going through the room for more valuables. Maxine escapes and grabs a gun that isn't loaded. Unfortunately, it wasn't loaded. Yeah. And so he ended up shooting her three times. Then he stabs her. Then he gouges out her eyes and puts them in a jewelry box and leaves them there. Ew. He left Uh, them? Yeah. That seems like a lot of work to leave them there. That's very um, Game of Thronesy. Yeah, yeah. It like, is. well, the queen from the Game of Thrones follows me on Instagram. What? Lena Headey is that <gasps> her name? Yeah. Oh my mm-hmm. god, I mm-hmm. would half chat. There's a there's a lot of really interesting people that follow me. The uh, one actress from Grey's Anatomy, the one who plays Amelia Shepherd, um, she's Ooh. a follower of mine. I I joke whenever. Joe and I watch uh, Grey's Anatomy and he's like, oh, there's your friend. I'm like, no, that's my follower. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, speaking of age gaps, Hugh Hefner's widow. She's a follower of mine too. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. 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 Man, my mind is blown. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about, uh, we did a whole deep dive and compared Hugh Hefner with Bob Barker on one of our Patreon episodes. mm -hmm. Cause I had a theory that Bob Barker or Hugh Hefner is Bob Barker's evil twin. Yes. <laughs> or Bob. Yeah. He did have a beef though with Betty white about it. I got to know. Oh. Like I, I need to, that's going to be what, like when I die, I want, <laughs> and there's like questions about the universe. I want answered. That's one of them. <laughs> the rest of us will be like, what happens with that show that was canceled halfway through a season that never got an ending. And then Garrett's going to be like, Hey, Betty and Bob, I need us all to sit down and talk about this elephant. <laughs> I need <laughs> and to the know elephants the there. <laughs> and then Garrett will just send messages, you know, like down so that we all can know that. Mm, yeah. We're yeah. Still here, you know, it's the opposite of that paper that do those like lanterns that go up into the sky, those paper That's lanterns. Like <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's just, just going to send them down to. <laughs> I'm going to be writing on a steamy mirror when somebody's <laughs> taking a shower. <laughs> You're never going to (laughs) guess. It was all Hugh Hefner's fault. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so after the eyeballs, um, (laughs) a month and a half later, uh, he breaks into another family home, Bill and Lillian Joy's home in Monterey Park. He shoots the dude in the face, beats him unconscious, and then binds Lillian and then searches their home for valuables, and then he rapes her. So Bill ended up dying in the hospital a little bit later from oh, wow. being shot in the face. How do you get shot in the face and you you survive uh, long enough to get to a hospital? I mean, I have that question about people who try to take their own lives by shooting themselves in the face, and then they end up, you know, horribly scarred and, you know, which is, you know, of course, devastating, you know, two different ways, I guess mm-hmm. you could look at it. Um, but yeah, it, it's remarkable to me that those types of injuries are somehow survivable in any way. I mean, your, your head is just so vascular anyway, Mm -hmm. that you wouldn't just lose enough blood to not survive, let alone damaging your brain, which is, you know, I'd argue in charge of it all. (laughs) My mom had a patient that survived a self-inflicted gunshot wound. 
Whoa. And they had to like, they were like warning people before they went in the room because it was like so shocking, like yeah. the state that he was in after the fact, but he survived it. So about two weeks after he kills that family, um, well, kills the husband. He didn't kill the, the wife? So she survived? Says, yeah. Because he shot, he shot the man in the face. He beat him until he became unconscious. And then he tied up Lillian. So, and rapes her. But I don't think that he, he didn't injure her with the gun. What about her eyeballs? Oh. No, that was, that was before. <laughs> that was, like, that was the uh, other one. Yeah. That oh. was the one before that one. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, she doesn't have eyes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, poor she's lady. Dead. Yeah, that one's dead. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So May 29th, 1985, he has a stolen car. He did this a lot. He he would boost cars. Um, so he took the stolen car to Monrovia, California, and he broke into the house of Mabel Bell and Florence uh, Nettie Lang. So he attacked old little Nettie with a hammer. Uh, he tied yes. her up in the bedroom and then he ties up and attacks Bell. And he took Bell's lipstick to draw a pentagram on her body and the walls of both of their bedrooms after he raped her. The women were found two days later alive, but Mabel Bell, she eventually died because of the injuries that he inflicted on her. The one that two he beat days. with a hammer survived? Yes. Mm-hmm. The Whoa. one that he beat with a hammer survived. Two he days. He should not be a carpenter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, he took that stolen car to Burbank, and he broke into the house of Carol Kyle, and he tied her and her son up, and her son was 11 years old. He had the son point out where the valuables were, and then he rapes the mom. And then tied the son to her and, you know, ran away after that. So a couple months later, he drives a stolen car to Arcadia to the house of Mary Louise Cannon. He knocks her out with a lamp, stabs her with a knife uh, from her kitchen, and then they eventually found her dead. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, he's like going all up the California. And it's like sloppy as hell about it. Like there's no planning. This is just like. It yeah, it's impulsive seems very, um, impulsivity to the max. Yeah, like like very almost kind of like Manson family, like just mm -hmm. completely like manic. Yeah, yeah, like fully out of control, just reacting. I don't even know. Like it's I, like I can't even having impulse control issues. Like I go shopping. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like I can't. And even then, I'm like, well, I'll just add it to my cart and then forget that I have the tab. You don't like for, put you know, eyeballs into a jewelry box. That's not a impulse. Well, I do, thing. but that's you know. Then I make them into earrings, and it's <laughs> I do something with my jewelry box eyeballs, <laughs> as one should. Mm -hmm. yeah side note yeah. those would be really cool earrings <laughs> not like real eyeballs i'm just saying like, <laughs> if you had like garrett's a psycho dang, yeah but i used to have like the eye did y'all not have like the eyeball rings in like middle school oh where... sure yeah i've seen them on etsy and i want one yeah so bad yeah i used to i used to wear them too so i agree garrett um eyeball earrings would be very cool get like a whole matching set especially if they were the kind that like are in the they are like in a a globe themselves, so they always like face up. So like when you move, they'll like do, oh. but then like recenter. That'd be like cool. the like the book from Hocus Pocus. Yes. That's what I want. Yes, I yes, want yes. that on a ring with less oh. blinking. I don't want the blinking. <laughs> Good call. Good call. Beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> if you want the cursed eye, it has to blink. <laughs> but y'all were talking about how like sloppy too. I, I mean, he was shooting these people in the face and then, so now he's just grabbing whatever's there. I don't, you think that he ran out of bullets and he couldn't afford it with the stuff that he was stealing, but he didn't want to stop murdering. I wasn't think there he was something wanted... about pawning things. Like, wasn't he going into like pawn shops with some of the stuff that he was stealing? And I think that's how he was subsisting, wasn't it? Am I oh, misremembering? No, you tell me, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall My memory's that. so big. But I feel like the reason that he's now using what he can find in their homes, 
I think that that's like a different type of escalation. He's still going for that dopamine where like now he can't even rely on something that he brings himself. He has to like find a way to kill them. And then there's also like Mm. the even scarier idea that, which I feel like was also very um, Israel keys where it's like, I'll use what you have against you. And so then like you, when, especially, you know, he's binding these women and then going through their belongings. So then you're just sitting there and BTK did this as well, where you're just listening to whatever he's doing and you can't see that him, you can just hear him like going through drawers or whatever. And, you know, then he comes back and it's like, oh, the, like I, in my family, there's a couple like knives that have, they were made by somebody in my like way back generations. Mm -hmm. That's cool. But like, it's sort of like, oh, you took great grandma's knife and that's what you're going to kill me with is this random knife that was in a drawer that has been in my family for generations or like, oh, you're going to use, like, I'm looking at the collar that belonged to my dog that died a billion years ago now. Like, you're going to use that to strangle me. Like, and it's sort of like these things that are around my, my home that, are innocuous they're not weapons but you're using them against me and I think it's possible that to him it's like well it's one less thing for me to bring it's one less thing for me to forget to take with me and they probably die faster when you shoot them in the face and versus stabbing someone hitting them in the head with a lamp like well I would think that the when you're enjoying the process yeah Mm -hmm. that like yeah when you're shooting a gun, not that I've ever shot a gun, but it's, it's just the one, like the kickback in your hand when you're stabbing somebody or you're slicing their throat, you really get to like, feel that you, you get to put how much pressure is involved in that. And I'm wondering if that's more where he was getting his thrills then at that point. It's so much more intimate. Yeah. Like even with the binding, like he could tie those knots as hard as he, or as tight as he wanted and could, see, you know, their hands turning purple if the circulation was getting cut off or whatever and could see, and you know, it's more face to face. Like, yeah, a gun is scary, but if somebody comes at me with a knife, I'm still not going to love it. Like mm-hmm. just, <laughs> just so and then they, they have that fear longer too, mm-hmm. more than that. Just mm-hmm. instantaneous. Speaking of choking, um, you got right to the next one that oh. he did three days later. Yeah, three days later, he headed to uh, Sierra Madre, California, where Whitney Bennett was, 16-year-old. He attacks her while she was asleep with a tire iron. Then he tries to strangle her with a telephone cord, but the cord sparks, and then she started to breathe. So like that electrical impulse, I guess, restarted her heart. Um, Anyway, he ran away believing that Jesus saved her. And so she ended up surviving that attack. Whoa. Yeah. Mr. Pentagram on the 83 year olds with hammers to their head believe that Jesus intervened on this one. I guess so. The the 16 the year old Why wasn't not? supposed to die, but everybody else was. So then like, two I days mean, after yeah, that, that, on July 7th, he breaks into Joyce Lucille Nelson's uh, Monterey Park home. He burglarized her home and then he beat her to death, but he left a shoe print on her face. Oh, that's and nice. Then on Jesus the same- really left a, an imprint on him. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he didn't he didn't save this one. So then he went uh on the same day, he went into Sophie Dickman's home. He handcuffed her at gunpoint, and then he tried to rape her. I just saw tries rape her. So the same day, the same day. And he stole her jewelry. But with this lady, he told her to swear on Satan that he stole everything of value in her home. Well, this was also like during the height of the satanic panic, Mm -hmm. um, West Memphis three, all that. So it makes sense also if this is getting kind of notoriety. And again, if he's seeing in the news, oh, you know, he drew a pentagram and they really reported on the pentagram. It must be Satanists that are killing these people. Um, then, and he's traveling all over, you know, if he's seeing on the news, oh, it's Satanists, it's Satanists. Then like, he can kind of build that up to- Or mental illness. If he's like super delusional or getting well, really it, paranoid or- I think it could go either way. I don't, and I don't know if we can 
give him enough credit to say that he was watching the news and trying to lean into the Satanist thing in order to mislead the police, or if he was doing it because he wanted that attention and thought that that was cool because he wasn't all there, or like you said, like it's a mental illness thing and he genuinely believed that he was doing these things for Satan. I don't know that it really goes that far though. Yeah. I I think he was definitely interested in satanic stuff. I think that was part of like why he was choosing to sleep in cemetery some too, Mm -hmm. that he started trying to like, because like you were saying with the satanic panic stuff, I mean, even in the nineties, early two thousands, and maybe just be because I'm from the South, but, um, you know, a lot of people were intrigued by satanic stuff because you're not supposed to know about it, or it's this taboo thing that still kind of carried over, lingered over for a couple decades after. I feel like Marilyn Manson was really riding that wave still. So that makes sense. Along yeah. with like being a predator, but um, yeah. it was definitely like kind of getting some yield out of that lingering satanic panic concern. Oh, for sure. Had. Yeah. And I think you can still see, I mean, I know that even going when I went to Salem, Massachusetts last year, love that like, place. That's so well, fun. even going into some of those shops, I was like, oh my God, like, am I supposed to be here? Like, not that I felt like I was breaking the law or doing something wrong by, you know, looking at all these crystals and stuff, but I almost felt like I was infringing on somebody else's religious practice. So it, I, I don't know that like around here we had too much. I know that I remember thinking like a, a pentagram was like satanic and mm-hmm. like there was always those kids in high school that were like, yeah, Satan rules. Right. Yeah. But like, I don't know that anybody really took them seriously. I think this like, yeah, you shot shop at Hot Topic. Like, I don't know. What <laughs> like we still all go to the same mall, but <laughs> like... <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I'm sure some of it, somebody had the anarchist cookbook, but. It's not exactly like, I feel like there's, there's like Satanism where people are like, no, I'm a Satanist. And that I, I think that like a legitimate religious practice. Yeah. Like do what makes you feel good. And as long as you're not hurting other people, Mm -hmm. you know, it's all consensual, then like knock yourself out, go for it, pal. So it's like, to the extent that I'm like, yeah, Satanism is real. It's not what people like Richard Ramirez and their ilk make it out to be it's not this like dogma that you have to perform for to get what you want or to satisfy whatever deity you think that you're pleasing i'm pretty sure eyeballs in a jewelry box is like in their 10 commandments (laughs) maybe i don't know they they still haven't been allowed to put the satanic 10 commandments in any courthouses so i haven't been able to verify (laughs) i still can't believe that he left it like that just seems like such a but I, I guess mean, that would you... be very ADHD to forget it, right? Too <laughs> like in the rush. Well, it's of like, killing. like put them. So like I'm gonna put these here so I don't forget them, and then you completely forget it for like Just three years without yeah. your like. <laughs> token that you want to yeah, keep like those hostess gifts that I just have in a closet and then I yes. stumble upon them in spring cleaning like oh yes. shit I could have given this candle away like four times yep <laughs> or to anticipate the shock value but I'm so but with ADHD I'm not good at that like I want to see the shock value right you know what I mean that's so why like I even... love saying crazy shit to Garrett a lot <laughs> <laughs> she always gets the reaction she's looking for hmm. <laughs> Well, so our boy took about a two week break oh, and, wow. um, vacation. Yep. he, yeah. he went and bought him a machete and he stole oh. a different vehicle and he Where decided that you he buy was a machete. I don't like, know. is that it from like Dick's sporting goods or something? Like you could probably get one at like a garden supply store. I feel yeah. like yeah, probably really? in California. Yeah. They use them like in fields and stuff. I guess I just always think of it as a weapon, but I suppose it started as something functional. It's like, yeah, it definitely has a, f- it's like a scythe, right? Like, Definitely has a function. Yeah. That's a good it's question. Like I was wondering too. Now I'm like, where? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, they the, definitely uh, sell them. It probably had a cool little pentagram emblem on it too. Right. It's next to the army Navy store actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's the weapons and more store that's where it is yeah weapons and more <laughs> he found out from his cousin mike where he could get that yeah, yeah right all the good yeah, weapons. exactly mm-hmm. yeah it's like overstock.com but for 
really dangerous stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So in Glendale, he, uh, he went to Layla and Max and Needing's home. So he killed both of them with a machete and a gun. And of course he burglarizes their home, but he wasn't done. He decided that he was going to keep driving. He goes over to Sun Valley. He breaks into the Covaneth home. These people have some great last names. I keep saying that. And he ended up shooting Chainerong, which is uh, that person's name. And then he rapes and beats some kid. And he ended up tying their eight-year-old son up. And he forced the person that he just raped to point out the valuables in the home. And he also makes her swear to Satan that she isn't hiding money either. So I wonder if he's now feeling like he is using the swear to Satan thing after he thought that Jesus saved that one girl. So like keep a little further away his, if yeah. they're swearing to Satan. Yeah. Like maybe that's his middle or finger to Jesus. Maybe. And I wonder if, you know, there was a level of psychosis where he thought of himself as Satan mm, on earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good he's thought kind too. of making them swear to him, but like they don't know. So then the, the following month, he ends up breaking into Chris and Virginia Peterson's home. He shoots Virginia in the face. Then he shoots Chris in the neck and he tries to get away from the scene. But Chris fights back. He ends up escaping. But the couple actually survives that. I'm t- yeah. like this. <laughs> there's that scene in Dumb and Dumber where um, Harry played by Jeff Daniels is like trying to shoot the bad guy and like shoots all around him on a wall. <laughs> and uh, Lloyd, Jim Carrey's character is like, Harry, you're a terrible shot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how seriously. are all these people surviving? <laughs> like you got shot, in the, shot in the face. <laughs> like, right. I just feel like if I got shot in the neck, like my spinal column's like right there. Like mm-hmm. how, how are you not paralyzed? And your windpipe, like, oh uh, yeah. And your arteries. Right. Like, like your carotid artery. <laughs> that's at least one of the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> and you got them on each side. Like, yes. So it's like twice the chance to just like take me out. And yeah, that's, that's wild. Yikes. That is nuts. <laughs> so that same month he breaks into, uh, another couple's home. He fatally. He actually um, fatally shot Elias, who was sleeping, and then he handcuffs, beats, and rapes Sakina while demanding their jewelry, He and he ties up their three-year-old son. Um, and he doesn't do anything to these kids other than tying them up? Correct. Mm-hmm. Or like, I mean, like physically. I mean, Not that I read. Scarred, but... Yeah, it was just the, the family, huh. the parents that he ends up injuring. I don't know. Interesting. But where I got this from, they didn't mention about any attacks on the actual children, but his first victim was actually a child um, that they found out in 2016. But mm. so anyhow, at this point, he ends up leaving Los Angeles for the San Francisco Bay area. He breaks into Peter and Barbara Pan's home. He shoots Peter in the head. Then he beats and rapes Barbara. Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Speaking of torturing children. <laughs> Wait, his name is actually Peter Pan. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh. Man, I wonder if it's announced like pun or something, but it's P-A-N. Maybe. <laughs> oh, 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 no. Uh, uh, or Peter like Pan. Peter is like a, like an anglicized version and like his actual name was like something else but he just went what was the wife's name not wendy not wendy oh man oh (laughs) barbara Barbara. (laughs) yeah right (laughs) well poor barbara he ended up uh beating and raping her and then he fatally shot her he used lipstick to draw a pentagram and write jack the knife on a bedroom wall i don't know if he was trying to get his name changed So Mm. he ends up driving to... That is an ADHD thing, too, to miss your lyrics. (laughs) Yeah, or, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, like Jack the Ripper, and you're just, like, confused. (laughs) I mean, they thought Jack the Ripper was a Satanist, too, so... Yeah. There's there's a couple cool connections with him to other people that he could have been. Um, So he ends up 
driving to Mission Viejo in a stolen orange Toyota. And he there, James Romero Jr.'s 13-year-old son, hears Richard outside their home, wakes up his parents. Uh, Richard flees, but the family gets a glimpse of the color and the make of his car and part of the license plate number. That day, night, he breaks into Bill Carnes and Inez Erickson's home. He shoots Carnes three times in the head. So now, I guess, instead of one shot, he thinks that it, it takes three. Maybe well, he'll actually I mean, kill them. Yeah. He's real bad at using just the one bullet. So mm-hmm. he tells Erickson that he's the night stalker and that she must swear to love Satan. After raping her, he tells her, tell them the night stalker was here. Erickson later gives officials the descriptions of Richard and that they are able to find the stolen car in Los Angeles. There's a single fingerprint on the mirror that matches Richard's. We know who you are now and soon everyone else will, is what the officials say whenever they were releasing a 1984 mugshot of his. And they also told him that there's going to be no place that you could hide. So he takes the bus to Tucson, Arizona at the end of August to visit his brother. He returns to California the next morning. His mugshot is all over the newspapers, which he notices. He attempts to carjack a woman's vehicle because, you know, that's him. Um, But a group of bystanders go after him. And one of them, they manage to hit him in the head and they pin him down until the cops get there. So the court was kind of interesting Because jury selection began in July of 1988, and at his first appearance, he yells, hell, Satan, and has a pentagram on his hand. Yes. And he, like, held it up to show the cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that creepy picture of him with his hand up. Mm -hmm. But his trial got delayed because one of the jurors was a no-show. And they later found Phyllis, yeah, Phyllis Singletary was her name but they later found her shot and killed in her apartment so the jury wondered if richard was behind her death but then yeah they later de- yeah but they later determined that it was her boyfriend that killed her and then he committed suicide god mm-hmm. Ugh, so in september the next yeah how random right yeah timing yeah also so- real bad time to try to kill your girlfriend when she has fucking jury duty and the fucking cops are going to notice when she's missing like day (laughs) one like right away like (laughs) well he killed himself too so i mean they didn't go find him i guess he didn't really care but Mm -mm. so in september 20th 1989 he is convicted on 13 counts of murder five attempted murders 11 sexual assaults and 14 burglaries and that ended up putting him on death row but he ended up dying, like I told you, of B cell lymphoma, um, June seventh, twenty thirteen, at the hospital in California. But in twenty sixteen is when they actually linked his DNA to what they now think is his first murder to a nine year old May Long. I think a Chinese American girl, she was murdered in the basement of the San Francisco hotel where he was living. She was raped. She was stabbed to death before he hung her body from a pipe. So it wasn't what year did that happen? 1984, April 10th. Oh, so right before he went Mm -hmm. on the spree. Right. Right. And he was. So I guess when you said earlier that it was a child, I was wondering if it happened when he was still a teenager or oh, something. Yeah. Um, but no, he was like grown, grown. Yeah. He's nine years old. Oh my God. So I wonder if something like hurt him as he was doing this. And that's why the children weren't killed later in all of the other sprees that only the adults were. Well, murdered. all the other children though were also male. And he didn't attack any of the male adults either, other than to kill them. Oh yeah, you're right. Because so, um, even the six year old girl really the was female. Mm-hmm. And it, it, based on a lot of the names that you've said and pictures that I've seen, a lot of his victims were Asian Americans, um, which I think lends itself to the depravity that his cousin was showing him in those Polaroids mm-hmm. yeah. as well. That's true. Yeah. So that makes sense that that's who he would target generally speaking um even though like they say that serial killers generally don't kill outside of their own race um 
so it's it's very rare when that happens but usually there's some level of continuity between the victims and I think we see that with him with a lot of his his victims being Asian American but it's interesting that he didn't kill those other children but did horrible stuff to this nine-year-old girl Mm -hmm. like like stabbing and strangling and then hanging her from a a pipe like you know after raping her and you know torturing her basically in her last minutes was the in that documentary was that where they um I don't know if I'm thinking of the right one it was like a boarding house almost that he was living in and it was like super filthy I don't know okay you would um, you would have to remember that I know that I at some watch. point he lived at the Cecil Hotel which I guess you could call like a boarding house yeah. it's, but it's just like super haunted and dangerous yeah and next to Skid Row yeah. so I don't think they call it if that's that where that what that was now they call it the stay on Maine but that's where the girl was in the water thing right yeah the, Elisa Lamb mm-hmm. yeah and they still don't know like really how she how she even got into it right um but yeah that was wild. Yeah, that was a wild one too. I didn't realize that he was caught by like bystanders. I forgot about that. Um, in the documentary, they talked about how they tried to catch him because he was going to the dentist because he, I think at the some bite. point, yes, he had bit some of his victims. Yeah. And so there was like, um, in, in addition to the, the witnesses who survived saying like, yo, this guy's breath was gnarly. <sighs> like, It was burning my eyebrows off. His breath was so bad. Um, Like he's got to have some Oh, all I could think is like somebody in my space like that. (laughs) (laughs) With that breath. Basically, yeah. And um, so they like went around to different dentists and were like, do you have anybody who's got like, you know, physucked gums? And this dentist was like, yeah, I do actually. And he was using like an alias. um, That's (laughs) And so they were like, I just really wish the cops went to the dentist. They were like, do you know anybody with fizz up gum? <laughs> and the dentist was like, yeah, actually I do. Like, um, you know, what you know now that, that you mentioned it, <laughs> you know, drunk history, like where somebody's yeah. giving like love that term. show. <laughs> oh my I want that for like Katie describing true crime. <laughs> <laughs> and the dentist being like, ah, actually, yeah, I do have somebody like that. <laughs> now that you mention it, this guy has rank breath. <laughs> Medically speaking. <laughs> He gross. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so they said to this dentist, like the dent, like they pulled up his records or something and the dentist was able to, they were able to like verify, I guess. And once they had his mugshot, they said to the dentist, like the dentist identified him. And so they put like That's a right. silent alarm switch in this dentist's office because they yeah. were like, because mm-hmm. he had an appointment in. coming up. Yes. And they're yes. like, so when he comes in, Cause they, he was supposed to have an appointment and then like, he just didn't show. So then they set this silent it's alarm probably up. hitting somebody with a lamp or stabbing somebody with a machete. Right. Um, and so they set up this silent alarm and the guy came in, the dentist like did all this stuff. His receptionist is like frantically pushing this fucking silent alarm button and it didn't work for whatever oh, reason. No. So he, like at the end of the day, the guy calls the police and he's like, why didn't you fucking show up? Like what that, like I'm doing this. This is dangerous. This is a dangerous yeah. person. Like they almost like, caught him like so many times. And so then they, and that's when they realized that there was like a wiring issue or something and the yep. silent alarm wasn't working. And so then they Jesus like, wasn't it. in control of that wire, just the telephone no. wire earlier. Yeah. Right. And so they, they fixed it, but then he didn't go back to the dentist after that. Like he didn't, yes. he was supposed to have like one, I guess the dentist was like thinking on his feet and he was like, okay, you need to come back one more time. And then we'll, we'll like fully finish this. And like, I mean, that dentist is like got brass ones for sure, because that is a scary thing to kind of have to improvise but he didn't come back for the follow-up appointment. And um, yeah. But so- if he would have known he had ADHD, then he would know that we can't prioritize well. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nor, yeah, nor do we like, go to the dentist often. I don't some know. Of us. Richard Ramirez doesn't strike me as the type of person who keeps a day planner. <laughs> yeah. um, and also there was something with his tennis shoe, like the footprint that he put left on that woman's mm-hmm. face matched a footprint that they found outside the house where the boy woke up his parents and mm-hmm. he ran off. Yeah. And they found the footprint in the soil and were able to like a flower. 
Yeah, like in a, a flower bed because he was doing his mm-hmm. peeping Tom thing and were able to determine like, okay, but it was like something like he's, he was wearing shoes that were too big for him because the impression mm-hmm. in the soil wasn't deep enough for the size shoe he was wearing. So they were like trying to figure out um, why he would be wearing a shoe that didn't fit him. <laughs> Probably because he stole it. I bet he stole it from one of the houses yeah. that he burglarized. Probably. And he's like, all right, any new shoes? Here's some free ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there was something with him and a and a hat too. Like he was somebody saw him at a pawn shop or something and he matched the description and he had a hat. I can't remember. God, my memory is so bad. It's like I watch something and I'm like, <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. And then as soon as I turn it off, it's gone. It me, like disappears. Me too. From my head. <laughs> Like People there was ask me things. Yeah. They'll be like, have you seen this movie? I was like, yes, but I can't tell you anything about it. Um, I can just tell you that I've watched it and I can tell you how I felt about it. <laughs> that's yeah. it. That's all I got. Yeah. I know kind of who was in it. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's about it. Plot, I can usually no. remember a lot, but she'd be like, you know, that movie. And I'm like, yeah, I saw it once like 15 years ago and I remember nothing. Although I say this and then PK will ask me about some movie and I'm like, I mean, it's, it sounds familiar, but especially <laughs> I feel like if it was something I watched that was on TV back in the day when like you couldn't skip commercials. Yeah. Uh, like that is very <laughs> hit or miss for me. If I can remember what happens in that movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also will put like a docu-series on while I'm doing something. Yes. Like mm-hmm. while I'm folding laundry or if I'm working from home, I'll like have it on in the background. So I don't fully pay attention all the time. So sometimes I've watched it, but I well, haven't yeah. really watched it. Thank y'all for doing this today with me. Of course. I had a great time. Will you tell people where they can find y'all? Yeah. Um, so our podcast is called The Bar is Ankle High. We're on Instagram at The Bar is Ankle High. Um, that's definitely the best way to follow us because I'm real bad about posting to any of, of our other accounts. Um, and we come out every Thursday. Uh, we just did, uh, or af- right after this comes out, we'll be doing a series on depression. We're doing an episode about um, you know, LGBT and being ADHD and how that can inspired by a post by you. Oh actually. yeah. 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 Um, awesome. So we'll be doing that before, um, the end of June and, uh, yeah, we're, we'd love to have you. Um, yeah, that's, that's where you can find us. Um, or just go to the bar is If you want to listen link, um, and, and drop just search a- us little bit too about your patreon because you do some fun stuff on your patreon oh too <laughs> patreon is it's wild <laughs> yeah so our patreon um is at patreon.com slash the bar is ankle high and we do um bi-weekly so every other week we release a bonus episode called dysfunction junction um where we talk about basically whatever we want there's sometimes there's a reason why we're getting together to talk uh sometimes there's not so we've done things like <laughs> Uh, you know, we've done like little games, like what, what is a Lisa Rinna, um, performance and what is a name of a perfume? Um, we've done a game, <laughs> Hugh Jackman or Gene Hackman, where I had to figure out <laughs> which was which we just did a um, deep dive on army hammer. Yes. Yeah, we did. Um, we did, did a deep dive on Army Hammer. And as I mentioned, we did that deep dive on Bob Barker and Hugh Hefner uh, comparing and contrasting. And um, next week after this comes out will be the continuation. We just did an episode on ADHD and dating. And um, our bonus episode will be like a continued conversation that Garrett and I had about that topic that didn't make it into the episode. So um Once Garrett goes on maternity leave, we're going to be doing ad-free episodes for our Anklet and Limbo Champion subscribers, which right now just our Limbo Champions get that. But uh, since we don't know that we'll be able to do those bonus episodes while Garrett is uh, taking care of a whole other person (laughs) and themselves, (laughs) we're just going to open up the ad-free episodes. But yeah, we have a lot of fun on Patreon. Um, It's it's much more relaxed and um, you definitely get to know us a little bit better uh then from our regular episodes certainly you get to know garrett a little bit better <laughs> that's true <laughs> well thank y'all so much for being here and i can't wait till the next time i get to talk with y'all yeah i'm excited for our, our continuation of this 
or in my yeah. head. That's what we do. Yeah. 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 Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah we love it. I mean, honestly, every time I get to hang out with you, it's like so cool. I wish you lived closer. I know. I do too. I I told I told Joe not long ago. I was like, okay. So these two girls, I need to get them to North Carolina, at least for a vacation at some point, <laughs> they can bring their families, the house is big enough, we can like fold everybody here. Um, I've told him that a couple times, like if we, <laughs> if we got to hang out in real life, they would be my best friends. <laughs> so. Yeah. And we can all go golfing. Yes. Oh, yeah. That'd be a fun, a fun outing. <laughs> I love fun. it. We also have some cool, I don't know if you like putt putt too, but. We have Have this amazing putt-putt place that just opened that we went to Memorial Day weekend. Um, But, like, at one point, you have to, your first, from the tee box, you know, like, your first stroke is you have to hit it like it's on a pool table. So, you have to hit it like a a cue ball. And then one you drop into this thing, and it's, like, pinball that you have to, it's really fun. There's lots of little fun, goofy things because we're adult children. Well, yeah. Why not? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope y'all have a great rest of your Saturday and and thanks again for um letting me push it for about 20 minutes too from our start time. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Garrett Bye had now. to run into a bunch of stuff anyway. So. <laughs> yep, yep, I need to meet Claire. <laughs>